Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And we will now move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is a statement by Jenny Ruth on international development, COVID-19 support, partner countries and humanitarian responses. The Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. Minister Jenny Garuth, I call on you uh, up to 10 minutes, please. Thank you. I think we need a microphone. Thank you. Please resume. Presiding officer, as we've just heard from the First Minister, the COVID pandemic is far from over. But the challenges the virus continues to present for wealthy countries like Scotland can in no way compare to those the virus continues to present to some of the poorest countries in the world. It is therefore incumbent on wealthy nations like ours to work together to ensure that those with the least are not failed by those with the most. As the UN Secretary General Antonio Guerres noted in March of last year, this is, above all, a human crisis that calls for solidarity. COVID-19 has tested humanity. Whether in Blantyre, Malawi or Blantyre in Scotland, the pandemic forced the governments globally to act swiftly in order to save lives. Our international development partner countries, Malawi, Rwanda, Zambia and Pakistan, each have a different starting point on their recovery journey from the pandemic. And to ensure we do no harm and in fact contribute impactfully, we must therefore listen to the needs of those in the Global South and act on their ambitions for recovery. On behalf of the Scottish Government, I want to reiterate, we remain fully committed to playing our part in tackling shared global challenges and to international solidarity. Our international development offer was first introduced under the previous Labour Liberal Government, and indeed it has always enjoyed cross-parliamentary support since that time. And that legacy is a really important one as we build on and develop Scotland's offer further, and I very much look forward to working with opposition members on how we do just that. In September last year, the Programme for Government committed to carry out a review of our approach to international development in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that review focused on our work uh, on areas where we can make the biggest difference in our partner countries against that new reality of COVID-19. I announced the results of that review to Parliament in March of this year, and today I want to give a further update to Parliament focused on the Scottish Government's response to COVID-19 in our partner countries. Since the start of the pandemic, we have committed £3.5 million from the international development budget to provide overseas assistance on support for COVID-19. Most of our international development funded projects were able to continue throughout the pandemic, delivering vital work on the ground. At the very start of the pandemic, we sought to support existing partner organisations where that was possible. That allowed for projects to pivot their funds and adjust their programmes accordingly. For example, the MALDEMP project, which runs in conjunction with Glasgow University, was able to pivot £20,000 to support the purchase of tablets and data bundles for remote teaching at the Malawi Kamuzu University of Health Sciences. And that teaching for trainee dentists was absolutely essential for a country of 19 million people, which has less than 50 qualified dentists nationally. Perhaps one of the most important decisions that we took last year was to devote a fifth of the international development budget to one particular initiative. In November of last year, following discussions with our partner countries, we partnered with UNICEF to support the COVID-19 response by providing £2 million split equally across Malawi, Rwanda and Zambia. And at our request, UNICEF targeted some of the funding to vaccine preparedness, helping prepare health systems for distribution. Listening to the voices of the people who live in our partner countries was absolutely vital to ensuring we got our COVID response right. And one of the key drivers of last year's review was the need to hear directly from those who live in our partner countries. The review therefore committed to establish a Global South panel which will directly advise and also challenge government on our international development offer. I'm pleased to announce today that the two, first two members of the panel that I will be appointing are UN Women Malawi's Country Director Clara Ananjwe and Professor Emmanuel Makasa of the University of Zambia. When speaking with representatives of our partner countries directly, it became really clear that the particular challenges they faced included lack of oxygen supply, energy infrastructure to support health centres, and also on the delivery of education. But the way we've experienced COVID in Scotland is not the same as our partner countries. So we had to ensure that our offer met their needs. In March of this year, I announced a further and a final tranche of international development funding for the 2020-21 financial period, which was over £500,000 to support vaccine rollout, online learning and also research to improve resilience on COVID. 
That funding provided support to Chitambo Hospital in Zambia to install an oxygen plant facility and an off-grid solar energy system to ensure reliable access to electricity. It also funded Kamuzu University of Health Sciences to implement genomic sequencing capacity work in Malawi, which is going to help identify new variants of the virus and also improve disease resilience. It is also funding further support to the British Council to our existing Pakistan Women and Girls Scholarship Scheme to provide laptops ensuring IT resilience to enable online learning and also funding for Kids OR for a surgical scholarship and a clinical officer training post in Rwanda and finally the Community Energy Malawi Partnership to install backup solar panel systems at health centres in Malawi. This latest COVID funding to our long-term renewable energy partners in Malawi, SEM and Strathclyde University, is targeted towards health facilities, but we have already seen the positive impact of this additional funding realised in Malawi. Energy systems were designed by Community Energy Malawi to address specific and wider needs at each hospital, including a clinic which is also an HIV treatment centre and a TB isolation unit. And the benefits of these backup solar power systems installed in response to COVID are therefore wide-reaching and will have long-lasting benefits for the people of Malawi. Most recently, in this financial year, we announced further support to our partner countries, including £270,000, uh, which has been allocated to Kids OR to send 300 oxygen concentrators to Malawi, Zambia and Rwanda, funding to transport 40 NHS uh, Scotland ventilators valued at £750,000 to those countries, and £250,000 to leverage the provision to our partner countries of £11.2 million worth of PPE, which is our single biggest ever donation to aid the COVID response. Today, I want to confirm to Parliament that I am committing to a further £1.5 million this financial year to specifically target initiatives responding to COVID in Malawi, Rwanda and Zambia. Our COVID investments, which total £5 million to date, have also leveraged additional support worth at least £13 million, meaning that by the end of this year, the Scottish Government's contribution to overseas support, specifically on COVID-19, will be worth in excess of £18 million. I am very proud that we made the political choice to do so. In addition to the outlined support for our partner countries last year, £240,000 of support from our separate humanitarian emergency fund went towards COVID-19 response efforts for vulnerable communities in countries such as Syria, Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, Afghanistan and the Democratic Republic of Congo. As the global pandemic continues, now is not the time to turn our back on the Global South. It was a deplorable decision that the United Kingdom government took during the worst excesses of the pandemic last year to cut international development spending. And whilst the recent shift indicated by Rishi Sunak to restore the 0.7% ODA commitment is welcome, it won't yet be realised until at least 2024 or 2025. We also know that certain spend will be newly badged as ODA, further reducing spend to those who need it most. This simply is not good enough. According to the FCDO, Malawi will see a 51.5% reduction in UK aid spend. For Zambia, it will be 59%, for Rwanda, 42%, and for Pakistan, 39%. Earlier this year, the UK government announced an 85% cut to the United Nations Population Fund, which provides um, reproductive health programmes globally. That will have really devastating impacts for women and girls. And indeed, as Macdonald Makwaka, the Executive Director of the Family Planning Association of Malawi, has noted, Malawi has already witnessed a sharp increase in teenage pregnancies and child marriages during the COVID-19 pandemic. If the UK continues with its decision to reduce its resources that equip basic health infrastructure for women and girls to access family planning, more girls and women will die of unsafe abortions. We know the pandemic has been gendered in its impacts, and yet the UK government has taken a political choice which harms women in developing countries at a time when they need our help most. But it is also clear that the pandemic has been used as a political opportunity to slash funding for the world's poorest. So if the Prime Minister is serious about Global Britain, then he needs to start taking Britain's global responsibility seriously. He could start by ensuring that commitment to overseas aid was immediately reinstated at 0.7 per cent. The women of girls and girls of Malawi cannot wait until 2025. I was very pleased to meet with the Vice President and the Foreign Minister of Malawi and also the Vice President of Zambia during COP. The need for equitable access to vaccines was high on both countries' agendas. Indeed, according to the World Health Organization, Africa has fully vaccinated 77 million people, just 6% of its population. 
Recently, the President of Zambia highlighted that only 3% of Zambia's population has so far been vaccinated. It's therefore absolutely vital we create the conditions for equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. We also have an opportunity in Scotland to share our knowledge and support our partner countries with their vaccination programme. And while Scotland is not a member of the COVAX scheme, we will continue to engage with the UK Government on this matter. Listening to our partner countries is also really key in terms of the climate emergency and members will also be aware that during COP26 the Scottish Government announced a groundbreaking commitment to loss and damage. We also plan separately to treble the Climate Justice Fund to £36 million over the course of this Parliament. As I conclude, COP26 remains fresh in our minds and so does the need for international solidarity. And when I asked Malawi's Minister of Foreign Affairs how the Scottish Government can support Malawi in its recovery, he told me we must ensure we build back stronger in a way that is sustainable. When I reflect on what's been achieved in this past month, it's clear that the need for internationalism has never been more important. The world united at COP26. Now we must unite in a truly global response to COVID-19. Presiding officer. Thank you. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement, and I intend to allow 20 minutes for questions, after which time we will move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if those members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Donald Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Minister for prior sight of her statement and the support she has outlined? As she acknowledges, there has always been strong cross-party support for the international aid efforts of successive Scottish governments, and these benches will certainly participate in any work she undertakes with opposition members when developing that. Uh, the Minister comments on the UK Government's approach to international aid. Can I also welcome the Chancellor's recent commitment to restore the 0.7% OGA figure and the firm date given for that? The Scottish Conservatives have been calling for that to happen for some time, and we are pleased this has been acknowledged and acted upon. Much of Scottish Government support has been directed to international vaccine rollout, and rightly so in light of the pandemic. Can I ask the Minister how many doses have been delivered to date? And further, how many doses does the Scottish Government anticipate will be delivered as a result of the new funding announced today? And then more generally, Scotland has strong and pre-existing ties with a number of partner countries and programmes, which rightly continue to benefit. But when it comes to other parts of the world, such as Central and Southern America or the Indo-Pacific region, there is less of a Scottish Government presence. What factors play a part in deciding where Scottish Government aid funding is directed? Minister. Uh, I thank Donald Cameron for that question. There are a number of different points that I will try to respond to uh, in my answer to him. On his, his first point, he mentions the importance of cross-party working in this chamber on international development. I think that's really well established in here, and I hope we'll hear um, more helpful suggestions from other members throughout um, the course of this afternoon's session. On the Rishi Sunak announcement, I appreciate and I know that um, Mr Cameron supported that very strongly. I recall from the debate on Afghanistan that he, he raised that point. What I would say to him, though, is that there's still a gap that has been created because the UK government are not moving quickly enough on this. And actually, recently, we know um, that because of the aid cuts, the Independent Commission for Aid Impact has said that just last month, the ability of the UK aid programme to respond flexibly to the evolving pandemic has been reduced. So because of that, I think it was £3.5 billion has been cut as a result of these aid cuts. The UK government can't respond quickly and swiftly to the pandemic. I think that's deeply regrettable, um, and I would encourage Mr Cameron and his colleagues to um, call upon their colleagues in the UK government to move more quickly on that. On the distribution of vaccines to, to poorer countries, I think it was welcome that the UK government, and I, I say that we're not a member of the COVAX um, scheme itself, but the UK government is, pledged to send poorer nations, I think it was 100 million doses to poorer nations, but we know that it has so far delivered around about 9.6 million vaccinations or fewer than 10%. And it's not just, of course, the UK government who are struggling in this regard. Canada has um, delivered 3.2 million, which is about 8%. And the US has delivered, of course, the most at nearly 177 million. But that is still less than a fifth of the 1.1 billion jabs which were originally promised. And the issue with the slowness of the rollout of the vaccine programme in our partner countries is, as uh, Oxfam have commented, the only way to end the pandemic is to share the technology and the know-how with other qualified manufacturers so that everyone everywhere can have access to these life-saving vaccines. 
On the point that Mr Cameron made with regard to the Indo-Pacific area, um, Scotland has, as he will know, a historic relationship with Malawi and our support has been focused on um, the partner countries that I've spoken about today. So we have Malawi, Rwanda, Zambia, and we have a pretty bespoke offer in Pakistan, which is focused on girls' scholarships. Um, I would like us to have a much wider offer. Maybe when we're an independent country again, we might just have that. I call on Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Minister for her advance notice of the statement and also welcome her offer of cross-party work, both in this chamber and through our cross-party groups. She is right to acknowledge the importance of practical support for our international development partner countries to come through and rebuild from the pandemic and to address the challenges of our climate emergency. But can I ask her about the, the follow-up work to the vaccine preparedness work and support on oxygen supply, energy infrastructure and education? Can she say to date how many Sc vaccines Scotland has donated to our partner countries, Malawi, Rwanda, Zambia and Pakistan? And as the Minister said, COP26 is still in our minds, so we need to deliver climate justice. So could she say what the government's detailed commitment to loss and damage investment following COP26 is? How much funding will be allocated? How and when will it be delivered to invest in the adaptation and mitigation that is urgently needed now in our partner countries? Minister. Um, I thank Sarah Boyack for, for that question and again for that recognition about the importance of cross-party working. Um, in terms of the Scottish Government's direct support to our partner countries. It has been focused, as I mentioned in, in my statement, on PPE and not on vaccines per se, because we are not part of the COVAX scheme, and therefore it's very difficult for us to be in our partner countries because we don't have a delivery model in operation on the ground. But to date, um, we have delivered, as I, I mentioned, the £2 million fund, which was decided upon last year. And I've given a bit more detail around about um, the COVID efforts, which include vaccine preparedness. So the focus getting the, the health systems in our partner countries ready for vaccine rollout was really what last year, um, last financial year's rather, spend was about. In July, though, we did provide a further £270,000 to supply 300 oxygen concentrators to our partner countries. That was an issue that was repeatedly raised with me in a number of the implementation events we held with partner countries. In August, we also announced funding to transport uh, 40 NHS ventilators to our partner countries. They're valued at £750,000. And in September of this year, we announced £11 million worth of PPE um, which um, is our largest contribution to date, as I, I mentioned earlier. That work is focused on PPE and preparedness in our partner countries, as opposed to on the vaccine rollout itself, because we're not, as I mentioned, a member of the COVAX team, but we are continuing to work with health colleagues. We're also looking at what we might do to help support vaccines on the ground. We have, as I mentioned in the speech, um, £1 million from the IDF, which is as yet unallocated. So I'm keen that we use that funding to try and get it to those who, who need it most, which is hugely uh, important. Um, I think Ms Boyack also touched upon the Climate Justice Fund, which of course um, was recently trebled um, during COP26. And there was also a commitment from the Scottish Government around about uh, climate loss and climate justice. Um, I'll advise the member that that fund specifically actually sits with another minister, not with me, but I can certainly provide her with more information from Ms McAllen, who has responsibility for the Climate Justice Fund. Thank you. And before I call the next uh, questioner, could I just perhaps ask for uh, slightly more succinct questions and answers now we've moved on from the front benchers. Uh, I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to see the continued commitment by the Scottish Government to its international obligations. Of significant importance is the commitment to supporting women. It's an unfortunate truth that around the world, women and girls are often disproportionately affected during a crisis. How is the Scottish Government ensuring that the principles of women as a sex class are given equal treatment and that this treatment is embedded in its approach to international development during and after the pandemic? Minister. I think it's um, really important, as Michelle Thompson has done, to acknowledge the gendered impacts of COVID-19. And that's been illustrated, as we know, by an upsurge in violence against women and girls across the world, um, and also an increase in inequalities. During the review of last year, I, I met with and I listened to, as I mentioned, our Global South partners, which included uh, a range of voices from civil society. And, other, and we listened to um, some of the impacts that have been felt in our partner countries. Gender was continuously highlighted by representatives from civil society. The findings of UN Women that COVID-19 is deepening uh, the pre-existing inequalities and expo exposing vulnerabilities in social, political and economic systems was also quite damning. But 
This is recognised in our new international development principles, which were shared last year. And that's why, following the discussions from the review last year, I announced in March that we will introduce a new cross-cutting equalities programme across all four of our partner countries, with a particular focus on supporting the promotion and equality and empowerment of women and girls. I call Sharon Dowry to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last month, the First Minister told the Chamber that our government is absolutely focused on providing critical help for the people of Afghanistan, with 250,000 being made available from the Humanitarian Emergency Fund. This is a welcome investment, but according to a recent written question I submitted, not a single penny has been spent. While I am aware of the difficulties of operating in Afghanistan, the situation is critical. Can I ask what work has been done to try and get the 250,000 to Afghanistan, Afghanistan? Why are the Scottish Government's partners unable to get funding to those who need it most? And finally, if the funding is not delivered now, when will it be? Minister. I thank Sharon Dowie for that question. Um, Sharon Dowie may be aware that there were a number of difficulties getting funding into Afghanistan safely, and that's been the, the major hold-up with, with this work. Um, the Humanitarian Emergency Fund is independent of Scottish Government, but um, I want to give Ms Dowie uh, an assurance that there will be a decision on this matter later in the week, and I'll make sure that her office um, are cited on that uh, prior to it being released to the public. I call John Mason to be fo followed by Fawzal Chowdhury. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome uh, the statement, especially the announcement of the extra £1.5 million. Uh, and can I ask, then, will third sector organisations be involved in, in this work going forward? Minister. Uh, I thank John Mason for that question. In, in terms of the Humanitarian Emergency Fund, as I, I mentioned to Sharon Dowie, the, the HEF panel is comprised of representatives from eight leading humanitarian aid organisations in Scotland. Um, those panel members who are INGOs are then allocated funding from our Humanitarian Emergency Fund. In terms of the International Development Fund itself, we have provided funding via a number of third sector organisations to partner with our partner countries and their COVID-19 responses. For example, we provided around £235,000 to First Aid Africa with additional funding to install an oxygen plant which is capable of producing up to 8,000 uh, 8, and 400 litres of oxygen every hour. That plant is not only about providing oxygen to the hospital itself, but also in terms of the provision of health facilities. The funding is also going to support the installation of off-grid solar systems um, and at least five health centres that are in Zambia. I call Foisal Chowdhury to be followed by Fiona Hislop. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank the Minister for her statement. Uh, she will know that many nations in Africa are still way behind in vaccination, with some only having vaccinated 5% of their population. Access remains a barrier and proving great difficulty to speed up vaccinations. Can I ask the Scottish Government how much of Scotland vaccine supply has already been delivered to Malawi and what are the future plans to bolster supplies? Minister. Um, I thank Faisal Choudhury for that, that question. Um, he's right to say that um, there is an issue internationally at the moment in terms of the provision of the, the vaccine to poorer countries. Um, Judging by the current rates of vaccination at the current speeds we're going, we'll need to see an increase of around 6 billion doses by the end of this year. So the vaccination speed is really important. And we know that in Scotland, we know this in Scotland in terms of the rollout of the booster programme. We also know that more than 80% of the doses so far administered have gone to people in high income countries and only 1% of people in low income countries have been given at least one dose. So there are clearly still huge challenges in terms of vaccine equity. Um, with regard to the Scottish Government and the provision of vaccines, I think I responded to Ms Boyack on this, but our, our provision of support thus far in terms of COVID-19 support has been in the form of PPE. Um, we are looking at other ways in which we might be able to deliver assistance in terms of the vaccine rollout itself. It is quite challenging because we're not a member of the COVAX scheme. However, the UK Government is. I have written to the UK Government on this on a number of occasions now, most recently to the new Minister, who is, I think, Vicky Ford, who was appointed in September. I am yet to hear back from her, but I very much look forward forward to working with the UK Government on this because I think it's hugely important that Scotland's voice is heard in this and equally the voice of our partner countries is reflected in the allocation of vaccine to poorer countries. 
I call Fiona Hislop to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, I'm aware that the Scottish Government is in discussion with vaccine producer Valneva in West Lothian about the business and export opportunities and that Valneva have recently secured a 60 million dose order from the EU pending vaccine authorisations from the EMA. Importantly, since the Valneva vaccine can be transported and stored at room temperature, could the discussions between Valneva and the Scottish Government lead to persuading the UK Government to use the Valneva product once all medical approvals are in place to increase its vaccine export to countries needing humanitarian support to meet the global responsibility under COVAX as the UK is behind other countries in exporting vaccines as pointed out by the WHO. Minister. Um, I thank Fiona Hislop for that important question and I, I recognise her understandable constituency interests on, on this. We very much welcome the positive results Valneva has reported from the stage three clinical trials of its uh, COVID-19 vaccine and the news of course that Valneva has secured a substantial order from Europe. As part of our wider work looking at future delivery of all vaccination programmes in Scotland, we're really keen to continue to engage with Valneva on vaccine development. At the present time, all COVID vaccines are procured on a four-nation basis by the UK Vaccines Task Force. We would welcome activity that would support donation of these vaccines to lower-income countries. Um, as I, I mentioned, I think in my response um, to another member, I had hoped to discuss this matter um, with the UK Government Minister with responsibility. I'm yet to hear back from the current Minister, but I very much hope to do so uh, soon. And when I do meet with her, I will raise this issue with her directly. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Minister is right to acknowledge the cross-party support in this, and like John Mason, I welcome the announcement of the further £1.5 million of support. I appreciate COVID has required speedy action. However, going forward, will the Minister commit to ensuring that those helping deliver projects in partner countries have early sight of the future funding and objectives, access to proper application processes and independent uh, assessment and scoring of bids so that we have the transparency that is the best means of ensuring that funds that are allocated are put to the best possible use. Minister. Um, I thank Lee MacArthur for, for that question. Um, in terms of transparency, I think the way that we administer this has been quite clear, but I'm happy to share more information with him. He raised an issue, I think, around about um, the application process for funding. If there is a specific issue in terms of an organisation he might be aware of, please raise that with me. I'm, I'm happy to speak to officials about it and get him more information. He's absolutely correct that that transparency is, is vital in international development. I think sometimes there is a challenge on this matter in the Parliament and certainly um, in a devolved government space because we're not an independent country yet, much as it might pain me, and therefore some of our dealings with our, inter uh, with our international development partners in the partner countries themselves, we don't have people on the ground. So it's quite difficult and challenging in that respect. But we do have good partnership working with, um, as was DFID and the FCDO. Um, and if Mr um, MacArthur has an issue he'd like to raise with me specifically on governance or on applications, I'm, I'm happy to look into that in more detail. Maggie Chapman to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement? I'm pleased to hear of the progress of the Global South Panel and look forward to hearing about its work in the coming months. I also note the comments on loss and damage and climate justice, and I too would be interested in the written response, in the written response that Sarah Boyack will receive. As the Minister has outlined, the Global South has experienced the pandemic in very different ways to us here in Scotland, with inequalities being exacerbated by the lack of health and other infrastructure. Can I ask if we can consider supporting a permanent vaccine rollout system in our partner countries and elsewhere, not just for COVID vaccinations? Such a system would allow vaccination against other diseases in non-pandemic times, but would be there ready and waiting, and thus a vital part of preparedness for when future pandemics hit. Such a system would also be transformative, especially given the potential advances in mRNA vaccines, which offer to help tackle a whole variety of diseases that are not currently susceptible to previous vaccine technology. Minister. Um, I thank Maggie Chapman for that question um, and welcome her comments around about the importance of the, the Global South panel. I think it was hugely important throughout the review that we were hearing from people in our partner countries and bluntly not from people in Scotland um, about the issues they were facing in terms of the COVID pandemic. Um, I will share with her further information regarding the Climate Justice Fund that she alluded to. Um, she, she mentioned in her question the potential permanent rollout of a vaccines um, approach in our partner countries. Um, on that matter, I'm, I'm happy to meet with her and discuss that in more detail. It's not been something we've been considering at this moment 
moment in time, but I'm not ruling it out. I think it sounds like it might be um, a positive way forward. But equally, I think we probably need to speak to our partner countries about their needs on the ground. One of the things I referenced in my statement was actually what we thought our, our partner countries needed this time last year wasn't what they were looking for at all. So things like oxygen containers, the use of PPE, practical help was really required on the ground. Um, so let me take this away and, and meet with Maggie Chapman in more detail and, and speak, of course, to the Global South panel and how we take that forward. I call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Picking up on the question um, asked by Faisal Chowdhury, throughout the pandemic there has been commentary on the unevenness in the way some developed countries and regions have procured stocks of vaccines, PPE, ventilators and other vital supplies. What assurance can the Scottish Government give that Scotland will play its part in ensuring equity of procurement of vital supplies for developing countries while ensuring our own population remains protected. Minister. I think Audrey Nicol raises a, a really important point. We know that access, as I mentioned previously, to PPE supply chains is really important in our partner countries. And if they are to build back fairer and stronger, particularly from the pandemic, as I, I mentioned earlier, we have provided large quantities of PPE, but also we've looked at ventilators and oxygen equipment um, and delivering those to our partner countries. All that PPE and ventil the ventilators which were provided are no longer required in Scotland and therefore had already been paid for. They are surplus. So it's all only right that we assist our partners in Malawi and in our other partner countries in that regard. I want to give a reassurance for our own population that um, we have adequate stocks, of course, and supply chains in Scotland at this moment in time with regard to meeting our PPE demands. But as I mentioned earlier, we have made a large donation of PPE to our three partner countries, and those countries need those stocks now to keep their healthcare workers safe. So we're stepping up to help. Um, a total of 25.7 million items have been shared um, in terms of PPE that's been shipped internationally with a total value that I mentioned earlier before of £11.2 million. Pounds. And those will go to frontline services in our three partner countries and directly help in their fight against COVID-19. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Co-Cap Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Funding for initiatives is always welcome, but it is also important that there is a clear due process for determining how these grants are awarded. Can the Minister confirm that any future in international development monies will get to those who need it most and will be subject to such due process to ensure transparency, accountability and value for taxpayers? Minister. Yes, I am happy to confirm that. And co Stewart. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, having met with uh, representatives from Malawi in Kelvin's Woodland Community Garden during COP26, it was concerning to learn of the challenges they face at the hands of climate change that in turn have also impacted their ability to respond to COVID. Following on from the Scottish Government's £2 million commitment to UNICEF, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to provide an update on the Scottish Government's work to assist in the fight against COVID in Malawi and wider Africa? Minister. I thank Cocab Stewart for her, her question. I, as I mentioned in my statement, we have so far committed over three and a half million pounds from the international development budget to give overseas assistance uh, in support of COVID-19 in our, our partner countries, which includes, of course, Malawi. And today, I've announced a further 1.5 million pounds for this financial year, which will specifically target initiatives responding to the pandemic in Malawi, Rwanda, and in, in Zambia. In addition to the two million pounds of funding provided to UNICEF, uh, as the member I think has referenced, in March of this year, I also announced a tranche of funding which is worth over £500,000 from the International Development Fund, which will help support vaccine rollout, online learning, healthcare, renewable energy and also research in terms of disease resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes uh, the uh, item of business on that statement. And there will be a very short pause before we move to the next item of business. Thank you.